If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, go with me this morning to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Have you ever wished that you could eavesdrop on someone else's conversation? Some of us have done far more than wish about it. I, for instance, wish that I could have been there in Philadelphia as the first and second Continental Congresses met together to discuss drafting a declaration of independence from Great Britain. That would have been wonderful. I would have loved to have been there as Adolf Hitler's generals told him, things aren't looking good, the Allies are coming. I would have liked to eavesdrop on the conversation when Doug McGee asked my dad to come to church. I would have liked to have been there the day that Dr. Bob Barber talked to a handful of believers about starting a church in South Fort Worth. There are a lot of conversations I would have liked to have eavesdropped on, but this morning we have the privilege of hearing the greatest conversation that ever took place on planet Earth. It's the conversation between God the Father and God the Son on the night of our Lord's death. John 17 has been called by some the high priestly prayer of Jesus. For others, it's been called the prayer of intercession. I like to call it the Lord's Prayer. Now, some would say the Lord's Prayer is, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That really wasn't Jesus' prayer. That was a model prayer. He was teaching us how to pray. I believe John 17 is the Lord's Prayer. It's in this prayer that you hear him pour out his deepest request to God. It's in this prayer that you see, like nowhere else in all of the Bible, the great intimacy that the Son had with the Father. And it's in this prayer, if you'll drop to your knees and take your place on the night of Jesus' death, that you will hear him pray for you. It really is remarkable. Let's look at John 17. We'll begin in verse 1 so we can put it in its context. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. We'll read the rest of the passage as we go this morning, but first, so we can really understand it, consider the place of the prayer. Verse 1 says that he lifts up his eyes to heaven and prays. You'll discover that the whole 17th chapter is his prayer. Look at chapter 8, verse 18, verse 1. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. So remember the chronology of this night. Last week we studied John chapter 14 and Jesus was in the upper room. At the end of that chapter he says to his men, Arise, let us go. So they are making their way from the upper room where they shared the last supper to the garden of Gethsemane. While they go on their way, Jesus takes some time to teach his disciples a few more things. He stops by a, a, a grapevine. He looks at that grapevine and says in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And then in John chapter 16, he teaches them about the Holy Spirit who will come to help them when he's gone. Then at the end of the verse, he says, at the end of John 16, he says, in this world you're going to have trouble, and you need to know that. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So this prayer takes place sometime between midnight and 2 o'clock in the morning. In the wee hours of the morning, sometime between when Jesus left his upper room and sometime between when he makes his way to the garden of Gethsemane. Now immediately after finishing this prayer, he will cross the brook Kidron. Now that's significant for a couple of reasons. 
Well, first of all, I'd like to imagine, and I have a map here, I'd like to imagine that Jesus was near the temple as he made his way to the Garden of Gethsemane. You'll see there, kind of in the northern central part of the map, the temple court. You see on the very eastern side of the map is Gethsemane. It's very likely, you know, it's certain that the upper room was in the city. And as Jesus makes his way from the upper room into the Kidron Valley over to the Garden of Gethsemane, it's very possible he passed right by the temple. Now during the Passover, the torches of the temple burned all night long. What an incredible place for the Lord Jesus as our great high priest, perhaps to lean up against the wall of that temple and spend some time interceding for his people. So perhaps it took place there. Again, after he says his amen, he'll cross the Kidron, and that's significant. During the Passover, thousands of lambs were slaughtered. Not just a couple of lambs, in fact, Josephus tells us that 30 years after Christ, there was a census taken. And during that particular week of the Passover, 256,000 lambs would be killed. The blood from those lambs would run down a channel from the temple into a bioduct that led off the ravine of the Kidron and flowed into the brook to take the contamination out of the city. In other words, as Jesus crosses over the brook Kidron to go into the Garden of Gethsemane, during this particular time of the year, that brook ran red with blood. The sights and smells of death were all around. And it was then that our loving Savior as the blood of lambs lay flowing at his feet, it was then he stopped to pray. And he did not pray for his safety. He did not pray for a lessening of his pain. He prayed for you and me. What a Savior. Can you see it? He stops on his way to the garden, leans up against the wall of the temple with the blood of the lamb flowing at his feet. That's the place. Now in the prayer, there are three particular parts. Verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. Verses 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples, for his 11 men. Verses 20 through 26, he prays for the future followers of Christ. In other words, if you're a believer today, he was praying for you. Did you know this morning that you are on the prayer list? of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that on the night of his death, you were on his mind. I'm going to preach about that last part of the prayer list tonight, so you need to come back and find out what Jesus prayed for you. We'll discover the first two this morning. Notice, first of all, with me, if you will, Jesus' prayer for himself. He really begins it in verse 1 when he says, Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So Jesus initially prays for himself. And it really revolves around that one statement in verse 1, Father, glorify thy Son, that thy Son might glorify thee. Does it seem kind of selfish to you that Jesus would begin his prayer by asking God to glorify him? In its context here, the word glorify means to magnify or to exalt, to mean much, to make much of. So Jesus is literally praying, God, exalt me. God, make much of me. That would almost seem as if it was a selfish request if it were not followed by the statement that thy son also may glorify thee. 
In other words, Father, make much of me as I head to the cross so that I can make much of you. How would Jesus glorify God in the next few moments and in the next day? We'll turn back to John chapter 12. Jesus actually answers how he will glorify God. Look at verse 23. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. How will he be glorified? Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. So how would Jesus be glorified? It's very obvious. He says, God, I'm going to glorify you through my death. Look over at verse 27. He says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And so we see here in John 12 the same thing we see in John 17. Jesus praying, glorify me so that I may glorify you. The Father answers and says, I certainly will. And it's in John 12 where we learn where God and Jesus will get this glory Jesus is asking for. Jesus will be the one kernel of wheat that will fall into the ground alone and die. But from that kernel of wheat will come much fruit, he says. Think about this illustration for a moment. Take just one piece of grain, plant it in the ground. When you plant that kernel, it will, if it grows, bring forth at least five heads, farmers tell me, in one plant. Each head will have over 20 kernels. So that one seed will produce at least 100. But if you were to take those 100 and plant those 100, we understand that the multiplication would be much. It would be many. And here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, my death will be the one death from which will come a harvest for God of billions of souls like the world has never seen. The Bible says that in heaven there will be a multitude there which no man can number. Billions and billions of people have been saved throughout the years and will be saved. And all of them have been saved by the death of just one man. That's what Jesus is asking for. That God would exalt him, make much of him, so that he could go to the cross and bring to God a harvest of souls. Jesus does not ask God to glorify him by giving him a fortune or by sending him to a palace. Rather, by sending him to a cross. And I just want you to think for a moment. Stay with me. How could there ever be glory for Jesus Christ in the cross? Let's think about it this way. All over the world in many different cultures and languages, if you were to ask people to describe words like love and grace and mercy and hope and salvation, those wonderful ideas, if you were to ask people all over the world to describe those ideas and only to use one symbol, Do you know what symbol the vast majority of people all over this world would use? It's a cross. And isn't it amazing? The Romans thought of the cross like we think about an electric chair. It was an instrument of death, an instrument of cruelty, an instrument of torture. But what Jesus did upon that cross would be so significant that it would become for all of eternity a symbol of hope and grace and mercy and love. And Revelation tells us that there will be a day when all those people Jesus died to save will gather around His throne to praise His name. And they will not say, Worthy is the Lion of the tribe of Judah that roared. No, no, no. They will say, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. In other words, His greatest tragedy would become His greatest triumph. 
there's an application here for, for us folks. Many of us pray in life that God would bless us and prosper us. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for that. But what we ought to pray is what Jesus prayed. God bless us so that we can bless you. God make much of me so that in my life I can make much of you. And sometimes God will answer that prayer exactly like you think he will. Sometimes it'll mean you'll get a promotion at work and a raise so you can have more influence and maybe a little more to give to the cause of Christ. Sometimes it means he'll give you a new car so you can bring more people to church. Sometimes it means he'll raise you up from a sick bed so you can continue living for him. Sometimes he answers that prayer in the form of a crown, but sometimes he answers it in the form of a cross. God not only gives glory to people when they are rich and healthy, he sometimes gets more glory when they're sick. He sometimes gets more glory when they suffer with a joyful spirit and with faith in God. Sometimes he gets more glory when we get well. Sometimes he gets more glory when we die well. So pray for God's blessing. But do it in a Christ-like way that says, God bless me so that I might bless you. Amen. And pray it with a commitment that however he answers that prayer, whether with a crown or with a cross, you're going to make much of him with it. What a prayer. Now we'll come back to John 17, 3 at the end of the sermon, but look for a moment at verse 5. Here's another thing Jesus asked God for. He said, And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is not the glory of the cross. Here Jesus is praying that God would give him the glory of heaven. He says, God, give me the glory that I had with thee before the world began. And I want you to just notice something because it's important. Jesus here puts himself in equality with God. He says, God, I had just as much glory before the world began as you did. All the glory you had, I had too. And what Jesus is thinking about in verse 5 is not so much the cross, but what will happen after the cross. He knows that he's going back to heaven, back home again, and he wants again the glory that he had with God before. Last week we talked about the glory of heaven. And I think by the time we studied John chapter 14, we were all ready to get there and never to leave again. Jesus had known that glory from all of eternity, and he left it. He left that beauty. He left that glorious and magnificent place so that he could come to this dirty, sick, sin world and save your soul. He left it. And Jesus says, I'm going back, and I want you to give me that glory again. And I think it's indicative of his selflessness that the shortest part of the prayer is the part that he prayed for himself. He says, God, give me the glory of the cross. Give me the glory of heaven when I get back. And then he moves on. Notice, secondly, he prays for his disciples he has two basic requests for these 11 men that have been following him. He prays that they would be kept and that they would be sanctified. Look at verse 11. He says, and now I am no more in the world. He's already talking about himself because he knows he's going to the cross as if he's out of the world. He says, and now I am no more in the world, but these, the disciples, are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So first of all, he prays that they would be kept, and that they would be kept together. He says at the end of verse 11, that they may be one as we are one. He says, in other words, God, you and I have had unbroken fellowship from all of eternity and I pray that when I leave, these disciples would have that kind of unbroken fellowship with each other. Look at verse 12. He says, while I was with them in the world, 
I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, save the, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's talking here about his 12 men. The son of perdition is Judas. And God always knew from before the foundation of the world that Judas would do what he did. Now that Judas is off the scene, no longer with the group, in fact, at this very moment, he's collecting an army to come get Jesus in the garden. Now that Judas is out of the picture, Jesus prays for the unity of the disciples. And he says, while I was here, I kept them in your name. I kept them together. Now that was no small task if you know anything about the disciples. James and John were part of the disciples. They were sons of thunder. Not easy guys to get along with. They kept asking Jesus if they were the greatest of the disciples. Within the group of the disciples was a man named Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were a political group that were zealous to overthrow the Romans. The Romans were occupying Israel at that particular time. They hated the Romans. They wanted to do everything they could to kill and get rid of them. In fact, in AD 67, the Zealots would lead a rebellion. And in AD 70, the Romans under Titus would come and level Jerusalem as a result. So this was a big deal that Simon was a Zealot. Also in the disciples was a man named Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. Nobody likes the IRS. Matthew was even worse. He extorted his people, took more than their rightful taxes, and he used that money to pay the Roman troops that were occupying Israel. Let me ask you a question. How do you think Simon and Matthew would have liked one another if it weren't for Jesus? They wouldn't have. Here's the point. The disciples were a group of men so different that they would have typically hated each other if it wasn't that Jesus made them one. Where did they find their unity? He says in verse 12, I kept them in thy name. In other words, as they followed Jesus, he taught them that there was a name more important than James and John. There was a name more important than Roman and Zealot, and that was the name of Jesus, the name of God. And I want you to know this morning that that has always been Christ's plan for his church. Not that his church would be full with a bunch of cookie-cutter people that all look the same way and act the same way and talk the same way and think the same way about every little thing. His plan was to build a church full of people that without him would have otherwise hated people. And those people would come to see that there was a name more important than Jew or Gentile. There was a name more important than black or white There was a name more important, and dare I say it, than Republican or Democrat. You know, Mark Loop and Karen McGuire are Washington Redskins fans, and we still let them hang out here. You know why? They love Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, unity in the church will come when people realize that the name Jesus is more important than any label they could wear. And our unity was so important to Christ that on the night of His death, He prayed that we wouldn't let anything be more important to Him than His name. And that we would have a unity that would be stronger than anything in this world that could divide us. He says, Holy Father, keep them together. Then He says... I want you to keep them from the evil one. Look at verse 14. He says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray that thou, I pray not, excuse me, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And you need to know that evil is not some nebulous force that floats around in the world like fog or steam. He's referring to the source of evil, to the evil one in verse 15. Jesus says something interesting, something we need to hear. He says, I'm not praying that they would be taken out of the evil world. I am praying that they would simultaneously be in it, but be kept from the evil of it. 
And folks, that is a clear indication of his strategy for his disciples after he would leave. Jesus never intended that God's people would hide behind the walls of some monastery, whether literally or figuratively. He intended that his people would be in this world, not isolated from it, but insulated from it. Kept in the world, but preserved from evil. I like what one author said. He said, the mission of the church is not to disinfect Christians and set them on the shelf, but to disciple them and send them out to serve. You know what happens if we remove ourselves from the world and from lost people? We remove all evangelistic witness. We remove ourselves from the very purpose that Christ has left us in the world, which is to reach the lost. So be very cautious this morning of a subculture of Christianity that isolates itself from people that Jesus died to save. He says it's us four and no more. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was a friend to sinners and his people ought to be too. So I want to ask you this morning, are you actively involving yourselves in the life of a lost person so that you might show Christ's love to them? When was the last time, believer, that you shared a meal with an unsaved person? Or you watched a ball game with someone that doesn't know Christ? Yes, they might say something wrong. Yes, they might do something wrong. They're not saved. And we shouldn't expect saved people to act like they're saved. What they need is Christ. And what Christ prayed that day is that we would be in this world but kept from the evil of it. Now, that's a very challenging thing, isn't it? It's incredibly challenging to rub elbows with people that don't love Christ and to not become like them. So how does it happen? How are you in the world but kept from the evil of it? This is the second thing Jesus asked for. He prays that they might be sanctified. Look at verse 17. He says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus prayed that his people would be sanctified. The word sanctify very simply means to be set apart for an intended purpose. It means to be made holy. So how do you live a holy life in an evil world? That's what Jesus is talking about. And he says you do it through the word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The greatest way to avoid a lie is not to study all the lies in the world. Did you know that? The greatest way to spot a counterfeit is not to study all the counterfeits in the world. The greatest way to avoid a lie is to believe the truth and to know the truth. So that when you're presented with the lie, when you're presented with the counterfeit, you know what's right and what's wrong. Listen to me today, the way for spiritual success for you and for your children will not be based on how much you isolate them from the world, but how much you teach them the truth so they can succeed in it. I want to ask you, do you want your life to be built on a rock today? Do you want to be in the world yet wise enough to avoid the deceptions of the world? Then listen to me, you need God's word. And how often do you need it? You need God's word for every day you're in this world. And that is every day. Amen. Folks, our family takes this very seriously. We study God's word as a family practically every day. My wife often has devotions with my children by the time I'm long gone before they go to school in the morning. When they come home in the evening, right before bedtime, we open up our family Bible. We study it together. We're teaching them at eight years old and six year old to have their own personal devotions, to study God's word personally. We're trying as we parent to connect every teachable moment and every time of discipline back to the Bible and to the gospel. We bring our kids three times a week to church. And yes, sometimes it's inconvenient. But we want them here on Wednesday nights at Master Clubs so they can learn to memorize God's Word and hide it in their hearts. 
Yes, our kids are involved in sports, just like your kids are. Yes, they're involved in a lot of extracurricular activities at school. We do all of those things. But I'm realistic enough to know that Will will probably not make it to the major leagues. Anna may not become a Rhodes Scholar or join Mensa. But I know with 100% certainty that they will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. And I want to prepare them for that. I know 100% certain that God has a great plan and purpose for their lives. And I don't want to be involved in anything that would negatively impact their ability to learn God's Word on a daily or weekly basis. If they're going to make a difference and be the light and salt that God intends for them to be in this world, they need God's Word. And that may mean that some things are less important. And some things are put in a lower place. On the night Jesus died, he prayed that my children would be set apart for his purpose in their life. And Tori and I want to be part of answering that request by the way we teach our children his word. Sanctify them. Keep them holy in an evil word. How do you do it? You do it through the word. Now I want to close by going back to verse 3. Would you look there with me? Jesus prays and says in verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Would you look this way? That's why he crossed the bloody brook that day. That's why he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and got down on his knees and agonized some more with God and sweat as it were great drops of blood. That's why he let that traitor Judas walk right up to him and kiss him on his cheek. And he let Roman soldiers drag him to a mock trial. It's why he let them beat him all night long. It's why he let them whip him with a cat of nine tails. And even though he could have called 12 legions of angels, it's why he let them nail his body to an old rugged cross and shove a crown of thorns upon his brow. And why he prayed that God would pour his wrath on him, the cup of his wrath, for every man, woman, boy, and girl. That's why he did it. So that you might have life eternal. And so that you might know God. That's what Jesus prayed for on the night of his death. I want them to know you, God. And I want them to have eternal life. Now when Jesus says the words eternal life, we immediately think about living forever. The words eternal life are not just about quantity because did you know this? Everybody in this room, regardless of whether you're a Christian, is going to live forever somewhere. You began to exist the moment that you were conceived. But there will never be a moment when you cease to exist. You will live forever in one of two places, heaven or hell. So eternal life is not just about long quantity, it's about high quality. The word eternal life literally means a life of the ages. It's the life Jesus, Jesus described in John chapter 10 when he said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And Jesus says, I want them to have that life now, a life for the ages, and I want them to have it 10 billion years from now. What is a life for the ages? Well, he says it. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He says a life of the ages is all wrapped up in a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The word he uses for know is not an informational knowledge. It is an intimate knowledge. It's the same Greek word that describes how two best friends know one another. The same Greek word that describes how a wife knows her husband and how a husband knows her wife, his wife. It's an intimate knowledge. 
Look what he said again in 17 verse 1. Look at what he calls God. He calls him Father. Father. That's the kind of relationship he wants you to have. God wants you for his child. He wants to be your father. And I don't know what kind of father you've had on this earth, but I can promise you as one of his satisfied children that God is the greatest father any person could ever have. You say, how can I know God like that? Jesus answered that question in John chapter 1, verse 11. He said, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Did you get that this morning? A relationship with God is not a reward that you achieve. It's a gift that you receive. It says here that as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So how do you receive him? Don't miss it. Even to them that believe upon his name. It's transferring your trust from your good works, from your water baptism, from your church membership, or from your religious background. Transferring your trust from those things to trust completely and wholly in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And he said, the moment you believe that, you receive eternal life and you become a son of God. Amen. When you get him, you get his life. Because eternal life is the life of the eternal God. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure God really wants me. If you knew who I was... If you know what a mess my life is, if you knew what I took or what I drank last night, you wouldn't say God wants me and his family. Look at one last verse. John 17, verse 21. He's praying now for believers through the ages, and he prays again that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. What's the purpose for this unity? that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Jesus prays for his people for the sake of those who are not his people. If you're not one of his people, he prayed that very night that you would believe in him. You say, I could never believe God loved me. I'm sorry, I've got to show you one more. Verse 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Did you catch that? Jesus prayed that you would believe in him and that when you believe in him, you would know that God loves you. And how much does God love you? It says here, as much as he loves Jesus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's the best news I've ever heard. How much does God love every sinner in this world? Just as much as he loves his own son. There's no such thing as an unloved person. No such thing as an unwanted person. The God of the universe wants you. And he proved it by sending his son to pray on the night of his death that you would believe in him. And if I were you, and I were sitting there and did not know Christ, the desire of my heart would be that Jesus would have what he prayed for. And I would turn from my sin and receive Jesus as my Savior. Let's pray together, may we? Our Father in heaven, thank you for allowing us the awesome privilege of dropping to our knees and eavesdropping on the greatest conversation this world has ever known. I hope that every person in this room knows that on the night of his death, they were on his mind. I hope that every person here knows that God loves them just as much as they love Jesus, and that all they have to do to get in this family, all they have to do to know God is to put their faith in him. And my prayer this morning 
is that Jesus might have what he prayed for. Might some person in this room put their faith and trust in Christ today. Father, for your people, we hear the priorities of Jesus' life through his prayer. What was important to him and what was not important to him. And Father, as we see it fleshed out like nowhere else in Scripture, may a heart for unity, a heart to be holy, a heart to know your word, may his heart become ours. It's in Jesus' name I pray. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you listen carefully? I just have one quick question today. If you're here today and you say, I am not 100% sure that I know God in an intimate and personal way. I'm not sure I've ever believed on Jesus and received eternal life. I'm not saved or I'm not sure. Pastor, would you please pray for me? If that's you this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you just lift your hand with mine? Would you lift it up? I know Jesus prayed for me to be saved. I know God loves me, but I'm not sure about it. God bless you. If you're raising your hand, just look up at me for a moment. Here in just a second, we're going to have what we call an invitation. We do this every week at our church. We're going to invite people to leave where they're seated and come and find someone up front. A woman will be here to meet with a woman, a man with a man, and they'll show you from God's word how right now you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Would you like to do that today? Then here in just a moment, as we stand to our feet, you leave your seat and you come. God bless you. Father, work during this time of invitation. May the prayer of Jesus touch the hearts of the lost and saved together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? If you need to come and be saved today, leave your seat and come. Believers, if God has dealt with you as you've heard Jesus pray for you, would you come today? Brother Johnson's going to lead us.